Because so much of what we do involves the use of energy, keeping energy affordable is critical. Americans spend a lot of money on energy, both directly when they turn on a light switch or twist a gas valve, and indirectly when they buy everything from eggs to medicine. Energy affordability is really important because energy infuses the things you do and the things you use. At AEI and research we did, we found that people spend as much money again on the energy that's embedded in their clothing and their cars and their houses as they do when they actually turn on the lights or pour gas in their, in their car. The average American family spends about 4% of its income on energy, but lower economic groups and people who live in cold weather states can spend a lot more than that. For example, energy costs can eat up 20% of a senior's social security income. Families receiving welfare might spend up to 26% of their annual income on energy. To put that in perspective, having to spend more than 10% of one's income on energy is one definition of energy poverty. During the recession of 2007 to 2010, there was a 48% increase in the number of families that had to apply for government assistance to pay for energy. Almost 8 million households received energy assistance in 2009, a small fraction of those who were eligible for such assistance. People concerned with social equity should really care about energy affordability because energy costs are regressive. That is, lower income households pay a higher share of their, of their monthly income on energy than do higher income households. And so when energy costs go up, it's the lower income people who feel the pain more than the higher income people. Things are much worse in countries that have pursued expensive green energy agendas, such as the UK. There, a study found that more than 4 million households will have to spend more than 10% of their income on energy just to keep their homes at a habitable temperature. A recent government report found, from a health and well-being perspective, living at low temperatures as a result of fuel poverty is likely to be a significant contributor not just to the excess winter deaths that occur each year, a total of 27,000 each year over the last decade in England and Wales, but to a much larger number of incidents of ill health and demands on the National Health Service and a wider range of problems of social isolation and poor outcomes for young people. Of course, compared with much of the world, the developed countries have it very easy. According to Scientific American, an estimated 79% of the people in the third world, the 50 poorest nations, have no access to electricity, despite decades of international development work. The total number of individuals without electric power is put at about 1.5 billion, or a quarter of the world's population, concentrated mostly in Africa and Southern Asia. And the situation is particularly acute in Sub-Saharan Africa, where several entire nations are effectively non-electrified. In 11 countries, all in Africa, more than 90% of the people go without electricity. In six of these, Burundi, Chad, Central African Republic, Liberia, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone, only 3 to 5% of people can readily obtain electric power. Politicians and environmentalists talk a lot about green energy without acknowledging that green energy, wind and solar power, are very expensive compared to other forms of energy, conventional forms, fossil fuel energy like natural gas and coal. Environmental groups talk about declaring war, waging war on the kinds of fuels we've used the most, such as coal and natural gas. But if it's war that they wage on natural gas and coal, it's war that they're waging on American pocketbooks because the energy costs generated by wind and solar power are going to go right into people's utility bills.